Okay, so we had um, really useful interjections from everybody, uh, all different sites and different ways uh, of engaging people. Um, but some key things that were coming out, for me at least, uh, were certain things around zoning of sites, how you choose uh, which areas people can access and how much access they can have. Clearly, um, people will not come to a place unless they're going to enjoy it or see something interesting. So you have to give them enough access for that. Um, and how do you do that? Um, do you let them go into the wetland? Do you let them get their feet wet? Uh, or do you manage how they access the wetland and how much? Um, looking at long-term funding for these types of projects, again, um, Brigitte was talking about the EU funding, which is brilliant, you know, for funding a lot of capital projects, initial setup projects, but then how you fund your activities is more difficult. Do you uh, make money from tourism, which will support your conservation and your staff? Uh, do you ask local authorities or partners to support what you do? Um, and do you keep it free so that people will uh, come and access it? Uh, the other question then is how you make your site accessible to people and how they find out about it. Um, quite often, wetland sites or lakes are hidden away. People are not used to visiting them. How do you encourage that? How do you go out uh, to the people that you want to influence? A lot of discussions this morning were about water quality, for example. So the amount of nutrient or the amount of pesticides that's entering your system um, and I think you were mentioning this morning about how, uh, what's the word, how unlikely it was that they were, the farmers were going to change the amount of fertilizers they were putting on their land. How do you go out and work with them? Quite often in the UK, we've seen very successful projects where you have farmers who are uh, open to the suggestions and are sympathetic to wetlands and to conservation and who will then work with other farmers. I think often farmers don't want a conservationist to come in and talk to them about the birds or why the water quality should be improved in the lake, but they do want a farmer to come and say, you can save money if you put less fertilizer on, if you put it on at certain times of year when it won't get wasted, or if you manage your land um, in a sensitive way. So again, how you do that outreach work away from your site is important. Um, we suffer from this in the UK with our centres in that we're great when people come into the centres. But how do you get the people that will never visit you? How do you go out and raise their awareness? Um, gentlemen there have been talking about how you reach urban populations. Uh, again, as you mentioned, urban populations are reliant on the countryside for food and for water. But they have no connection very often. They don't uh, understand how, where it comes from. Certainly in the UK, lots of people will buy things from the supermarket with no idea about how it was produced or where it came from. So how do we talk to them about the impacts of urban dwellers? Um, one of the useful things that we do is working with sustainable urban drainage, uh, which I guess sustainable urban drainage or sustainable drainage is a very popular thing. And we're looking at how we can work with partners to create landscapes in urban areas which save water, which store water, and which reduce, or reduce the likelihood of flooding further down the system. So lots of opportunities to uh, discuss lots of themes. So maybe a first question to you guys from me, just to get the discussion moving. Um, how, how do you think we can better uh, reach people who maybe don't normally come to our wetland centers or to our wetland sites. Who would like to come up with the magic solution? <laughs> if I go home with this answer, my boss will be pleased. No? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, would you like to repeat your question, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we reach the people that don't normally come to our sites or don't normally visit uh, the wetlands or the lakes? Oh, yes, it's a good question. Why? This is why. Mm. Yes. 
Maybe we can do it, uh, for, like, for example, in Poland, maybe we can try to take the money from a regional fund and environmental protection and make the websites. Because a lot of people, they uh, use the internet and this is not a problem. I think we can do, try it to this way. Yep, definitely. She's I good. think your presence on the, on the web is, is really important and how we um, put the right messages on our websites and make them relevant, very useful. For the, for the, activi for the planet activities, we have a distribution list the email, email addresses, email address. So all the people that uh, comes to the visitor center, we invite them to uh, to describe in this list. So when we plan any activity, we send the mail to all the people. And uh, normally, in one or two days, we have the activity completed. And uh, if we have uh, very uh, people who uh, who phone to reserve a place and it's uh, it's completed. We know that the, it's a very uh, very nice activity for the local people. So we have to, to to repeat to repeat it in one, two or three months. But they, we know also the activities that interest to the to the local people. And do do the local people pay to come to these activities, or is it a free event? Depends. Depends because if the planet activities we develop these activities are free, but if we contact with a local company for a boat trip, or for a rent bikes, or for other things, they pay to a local company, not to us, but they pay to a local company for the boat trip, or for the rent the bike, for renting the bike. Yeah. So it's a, it's another chance, another chance for the local companies to get money to involve into the management of the of the natural area. Yep, and I think ecotourism is a great way to kind of, not justify, but to demonstrate uh, how wetlands are inputting to people's lives and, and livelihoods, so that's a good way, yep. As regards Kish uh, Balaton, we usually distribute uh, some brochures, leaflets to the municipalities and uh, hotels in the nearby because uh, if somebody comes to visit a region it can happen that uh, that person not going to to see or or, or they don't um, know anything about Kishbalaton area but if they can see this kind of leaflet uh, they can visit it because this is in the nearby so this is i think this works from my point of view but uh, on the other hand uh, it's uh, interesting because a lot of people comes all over the world uh, to Kishbalaton. We have a map uh, inside uh, from Hungary and from uh, there's a world map, and uh, you can put a paint or paint uh, where you can show where you are from, and it's full of. So yes, everywhere. So it's interesting, but uh, we have also a website. So this is one way to give some information and what kind of attractions we have. So if they are interested in it, they can visit. And uh, I think if somebody visits this uh, region, they usually um, visit Kishbalaton area too, because they can spend one day in an active way. So I think both uh, families or, or uh, people from or students from school can uh, uh, can get some information, useful information, they can have a good time there. So, as regards our directorate, this is our way of distributing things. Yep, I think working with tourist boards or tourist companies is a really good way uh, of getting people who maybe normally wouldn't come, but they're just looking for something to do while they're on holiday or something. It's good. Uh, yes, in my opinion, but my colleagues can express themselves if, you, if they want. Um, I believe that uh, people that come here are uh, aware. Uh, that's why they come. They early, already aware, yes, of course. That's why uh, they come here and they like uh, nature and they want to learn more or they like birds, something like this. Uh, so we have to make traps <laughs> to reach other people. Uh, for instance, with um, the soirée du lac, uh, evening to the lake, 
uh, with wine, uh, and <laughs> it's a good trap to uh, <laughs> make people to raise people awareness, of course, because the uh, like concert or other activity different than uh, always ecological, uh, uh, problematic, and uh, this is the end of the world. Wetlands disappeared. Blah blah blah. Um, sometimes you, you can uh, um, send this message. Uh, in another way, maybe. Not, not always with an ecological way, surprisingly, uh, I believe so. Yep, good. Just uh, support uh, what uh, says Avri, because it's, it's, it's the way to catch people to go to visit to the, uh, to the wetland in, in other part of ecological. And after that, when they are there, you can also give them some uh, some some sentences so some uh, words to uh, to be these people interested in your uh, in your in your wetland and then come back to to visit you Anche io sono d'accordo completamente con quello che Totally agree with you You usually say that during conferences I do in, uh, totally agree with you, but namely for the web and the internet, websites, brochures, and mailing lists, this is really great. One more point, if I may, for young people, this is very important, so social networks are interesting as well, and they're very important, I, I mean, I have this impression. So social networks. And for schools in Italy, we try to have mailing lists, which are total. I mean, for the whole schools in Italy, we have total mailing lists. So we send an email on a certain period of time. And, you know, the same system, the same concept is used also for uh, the season, the seasons, for example, we try to have a mailing list for some reasons linked to some seasons, for some events, very specific for natural association, associations, bikers. Uh, we try to choose and to focus on those categories, which for the so-called slow tourism, slow tourism, which are, you know, an aggregate on the associations, and we try to work in that direction. This is for the groups and also the uh, monitored area of our park. But there is another important aspect. If we can, we should also be autonomous. Like if you have a family, then you could make a, a tour or, you know, walking around the park. So this is, I mean, more important. We should work on accessibility then. And we need to be more accessible. And in Italy, we are lacking, actually, of accessibility in that, in that sense. Um, but we should, you know, highlight that aspect, and that should be a leverage to increase that aspect. Great. Thank you, Giacomo. Um, questions then from the audience for our panel of experts. Um, I wonder whether there are some things that are coming up from your sites, um, which you're looking for external solutions to, how you work with other partners. Um, any observations or questions that you have for the guys who know how to engage partners and engage people? J'avais une question un peu plus pour le lac de Medvi. Est-ce qu'on n'a pas eu le temps de poser des questions J'ai compris. Donc c'était... <laughs> Donc c'était une question sur la formation agricole, parce que vous avez dit que vous dispensez des formations pour les agriculteurs, pour une agriculture plus écologique. Ces formations sont dispensées plus pour les futurs agriculteurs ou des agriculteurs qui sont déjà en place, qui ont envie de changer de, de, de style d'agriculture de, 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 
Alors, je vais juste finir. Et on a vu dans toutes les présentations, pour certains, que l'agriculture pouvait être un problème majeur dans la pollution des eaux. Et que je pense que c'est la bonne solution si on arrive à former soit nos futurs agriculteurs ou soit en place pour qu'ils raisonnent leurs pratiques. On pourra étudier l'eau, mais d'une bonne qualité. Yeah, uh, you are right. It's really interesting and um, very important. But uh, in uh, my region, we have like Bashkovice Center for Agriculture Consulting, and they have some meetings with farmers. They try to uh, show them how it's important to uh, make the correct uh, farms and what they are doing if they are put too much uh, nitrogen or something like this. Uh, this is one uh, a size and another uh, we changed the we changed the local law. So we have some special protection area uh, which is a catchment uh, area of the lake. And uh, in this law, you can see then you ca the farmers shouldn't put uh, minor f since, uh, I think, since uh, October to uh, April every year. They cannot do it, this like uh, stuff. Mm, so we try to protect its catchment and, uh, and talk with the farmers, but um, they not really want to collaborate it with us because, you know, they lose the money. So this, they. It's a little conflict. For young um, farmers, yeah, well, they are think a little different, you know, because they are young and they want to change something. But I'm worried about it that if they stay with old farmers, can be <laughs> the same in the end, you know. So of course, we try to make some meetings with them and talk with them and some give them some brochures to show uh, what happens if they will still do it like this. But uh, some land, some land. Uh, in the catchment area, they are rent by the um, foreign farmers, so they not uh, they not every time take care about it because it's not on their land. So this is the problem too. To also answer to your question, of course, um, as I worked in um, engineer school. Uh, in agriculture, uh, it depends on the program, of course. Sometimes uh, they students are aware uh, of ecological waves, sometimes not. And now the new program is, um, I, I don't remember the English word, sorry, uh, Agriculture Ecologiquement Intensive. It's, it's not, it does mean something, it's awful, of course. Ecologiquement intensive, no sense, no sense, or, or I don't understand this word. So it depends of the program. Yeah. And Fernando, for the rice farmers, do you have a, a similar issue? Yes, more or less, it's, it's similar. The young young farmers, uh, they they want to do better things. They want to use just the fertilizer or just the pesticides, just the, they are allowed from the U.S. But the, the old one says, we do this in this way all the life, so we are going to do it. <laughs> and it's also a, a problem, it's not a problem, but it's a conflict between the young and the, and the old farmers. But the old farmers are um, understanding and uh, they have to, to do more ecological uh, rice fields, rice c culture, because we are in the U.S. They uh, they receive funds from the U.S. from uh, from have some agro environmental practices, so they they have to understand that uh, the things uh, are changing, and they have to uh, to do it in the right way to preserve the the wetland. First, we were dealing with the strategy to use in our center 
and the approach that we had of the with the hunters. So the implementation of one park, we had this approach, uh, bilateral actually approach, and we obtained some results. But in our situation, the same strategy has been enlarged as well to the fishing world and the ag agriculture as well. What did we do? We tried to offer a collaboration and sometimes trying to give free, uh, I mean, free means to the local organization that handled the funds, the uh, previous funds from uh, Europe. So for fishing activities, for the former FEP, and then Fezer. Um, th so we wanted also to be really available, so our professionals, in order to ease the approach, the collaboration with those institutions which were handling the money, and as you know, it's very you know tricky to, to do that. And uh, so in that way, we had really a great uh, approach. So in our tra territory, it's for fishing activities on the coast, in the interland, and with the farmers. So we started to develop a discussion, a dialogue for the equipment, uh, for fishermen, but also the use of, as you said, pollutants and uh, fertilizers uh, from farmers. But we should go beyond beyond you know that aspect for 2014 2020 program as far as the uh, strategy is concerned in Italy I think that in agriculture the most part of the funds are dedicated to the biological or uh, agriculture so uh, we are organic agriculture so we are actually you know switching the generation of farmers f for fishing activities and agricultural activities or so farmers and, and and uh, generally speaking, you, you know, the, the father then gives all, the, you know, his knowledge to the, to the son and so on. And this is great because it's very important to start from the youngsters and to educate them on, on those, you know, organic uh, techniques and so on. And then the, the, the son would, you know, give information to his father about those new uh, laws and uh, techniques. So this is great, and I think that we should uh, go further, you know, because this, these are the fundamentals in order to avoid the conflict. Because if you create a conflict, then, you know, it's just useless, and we'll never have a result. And we do not have 50 years before us, so, you know, we need to really ease the process. Yep. Um totally agree with that. I think that, yeah, when you come into an aggressive situation with these stakeholders, then you will never find a solution. You need to kind of work um, in a friendly way to get them. Uh, it's interesting that there was a comment earlier about a loss of traditional extensive farming. So it's maybe the uh, young farmers need to talk to their grandfathers or their great grandfathers uh, to find out uh, the ways that people used to use, um, which have a lower impact um, on the environment and the wetland environment particularly. Um, right, so any further questions or comments from the audience? Yep. C'est une interrogation par rapport à une approche qui n'a pas été particulièrement développée, à savoir qu'on a vu qu'il y avait des échanges réguliers entre le monde scientifique et euh, le suivi euh, des lacs. Mais là, je m'interrogeais sur euh, l'aspect euh, évaluation euh, socio-économique des services rendus par ces milieux. Et je voulais savoir si vous aviez des échanges avec euh, les, les sociologues, euh, le monde de, de la recherche euh, non scientifique, euh, mais qui, fait néan qui font néanmoins des, des appréciations sur ce type de service. Great question. Who would like to take that? Sorry, we have a problem with uh, the translation, Italian translation. Um, so would you like to repeat your question because we just have a technical problem. 
Oui, je vais reformuler la question en plus court et en plus simple. Euh, il y a des échanges dans le domaine scientifique par rapport à, à l'évaluation euh, des lacs et des écosystèmes lacustres. Je voulais savoir si dans le domaine des sciences sociales, euh, il y avait des échanges aussi dans cette thématique et l'appréciation du, du service rendu par les écosystèmes aquatiques en lien avec le, le domaine social. Uh, je vais répondre en français, du coup. Or in English, as you prefer. Uh, oui, on, on, on fait appel à, à différentes disciplines, et pas, nos, pas uniquement, j'aime pas ce terme en français, uniquement les sciences dures, mais aussi les sciences molles, euh, comme l'histoire, géographie et euh, l'ethnologie. Et euh, cette dimension sociale, notamment au niveau euh, des activités euh, socio-culturelles comme la pêche, sont indispensables, euh, la pêche, euh, les activités euh, chasse, euh, ou encore euh, pour euh, tout ce qui est agriculture, euh, nous avons besoin euh, de connaître euh, les avis euh, des experts en ethnologie et en sociologie, bien sûr. Euh, nous avons également, euh, enfin ici, nous réalisons euh, des expositions aussi socioculturelles en faisant appel à, à des experts ethnologues et pas uniquement des scientifiques. Et euh, à l'heure actuelle, en termes de d'évolution, euh, de paysage, d'urbanisation, euh, la dimension sociale et forcément humaine est indispensable à intégrer dans, en termes de, de gestion et de sensibilisation des écosystèmes. I agree, and I think there's, there's also much work that's been done on human psychology and reactions to environmental messaging. So one of the things we always learn is that you should never tell people off. You should never castigate people for doing bad things, because if you say what you're doing is bad and will lead to destruction, the end of the world, it puts them off. It doesn't make them want to change. Um, but if you say you could change and help by doing something in a different way, then you're much more likely to get them on board and on your side, I guess. So even in very basic terms of psycho people's psychology and sociology and how you work with them, I think we still need to embrace that more. I think there's still too much of a gap between hard science and soft science, as you say. Um, and definitely, I think the hard scientists and the soft scientists don't always see eye to eye. Um, yes, Fernando. I know that in the Abu Farna Park uh, there are a lot of works of uh, sociology or uh, also ethnology, but I don't know uh, who are developing. But I can I could say that in, uh, in November 2016, yeah, in November 2016, the way of fish in the lake and also the sailing with the typical boats uh, were declared like. Uh, in, with a, with a mark of uh, interest cultural of the of the region, it was a mark the, the the way of fishing and the way of sailing with the typical boats. So there are uh, many many studies, many works in sociology or in ethnology are working, but they don't know more than than these ones. J'aimerais revenir rapidement hein, sur la réconciliation des deux cycles techniques, euh, le petit cycle technique de l'eau urbain et puis le grand cycle de l'eau naturelle euh, dans lesquels se trouvent nos lacs. Euh, L'expérience euh, que j'ai vécue à Nantes, moi, pour être rapide, j'étais fonctionnaire euh, au Conseil général et puis à l'agence de l'eau. Et on a financé à ce titre euh, des programmes qui, de tête pour Nantes, s'appelaient Neptune, Neptune 1, Neptune 2, Neptune 3... Euh, quelques centaines de millions euh, d'euros à chaque fois, des programmes quin quinquennaux. À l'époque, on avait devant nous, euh, traditionnellement, des services urbains organisés de manière sectorielle. On avait le service de l'eau potable, le service de l'assainissement, et à chacun, on fléchait des, des fonds et on progressait progressivement. Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé avec le temps Je vous la fais brève. Euh, petit à petit, euh, on a eu en face de nous des gens et là, parallèlement, l'agence de l'eau évoluait dans ce sens-là, qui se sont dit on ne peut plus réfléchir comme ça, directive cadre, etc., etc. 
Et il faut maintenant des programmes euh, multi-acteurs, on appelait ça multisectoriel, où on a globalisé et on a réconcilié de fait les cycles techniques séparés, urbains, et les cycles naturels. À ce titre, je ne sais pas dans vos villes comment c'est fait, mais Nantes est une des rares villes à ma connaissance qui est maintenant abandonné ses services techniques. On n'a plus de services d'eau, on n'a plus de services d'assainissement, on a un, un service qui s'appelle une direction technique du cycle de l'eau urbain. Donc il y a eu une maturation qui s'est faite où déjà on voit que le rendez-vous est déjà pris en disant on va abandonner le cloisonnement et on va aller vers quelque chose de beaucoup plus large. La dernière histoire concrète euh, qui a été faite, c'est comment Nantes se provisionnait en eau potable. On avait une seule prise d'eau sur la Loire qui était exposée à des risques industriels avec une réserve de 7 jours. On se dit, c'est pas possible, il faut faire autre chose. En cas d'accident industriel, euh, ça le fera pas. Et donc, on a été amené à passer un contrat avec un petit bassin versant latéral qui s'appelle le bassin de l'Erdre, pour les gens qui connaissent, dans lequel il y avait effectivement des masses d'eau qui peuvent ressembler un petit peu au lac, pour les gens qui connaissent, c'était les plaines de Mazerolles, avec une extension de zone tout à fait considérable, qui était envoisinée, environnée, également par une agriculture assez intense. Et il y a eu un deal entre la ville, les gens de la ville, et puis les agriculteurs. Les gens sont dit, la, la ville, notre eau est à la campagne, si on veut la préserver, il faut négocier avec les agriculteurs. Et la négociation s'est faite autour de pratiques de style, entre guillemets, bio, ça a été évoqué par notre ami italien, où effectivement, il y a une relative garantie entre des achats publics faits dans des lycées, des hôpitaux et toute la puissance publique, et puis une pratique culturelle, j'allais dire, assez soft vis-à-vis -vis de la protection de l'eau. Donc ces rapprochements-là, moi je pense que, j'en ai parlé tout à l'heure, il me paraît tout à fait important à terme à faire entre les lacs périurbains et les gens de la ville. Pourquoi Parce que les moyens techniques et les moyens financiers, les seuls moyens financiers pérennes qu'il y a actuellement, c'est les moyens qui sont autour du petit cycle de l'eau, qui sont liés au service de l'eau, eau et assainissement. De manière pérenne, si vous voulez avoir de l'argent, il faut rentrer dans ces cycles-là. Eux commencent à se rapprocher de vous, ils vous ont tendu la main en quelque sorte, je pense qu'il y a un pas aussi à faire vers eux. Voilà, j'insiste lourdement sur cette idée qui m'est chère, mais je pense que c'est une voie de progrès intéressante à terme. Great comment. Um, and yes, that interdependence between country people and town people, something that needs to be strengthened. Um, any comments? No, but it was a great intervention here. Um, yeah. Oui, on a beaucoup parlé de comment faire venir des gens dans nos centres de découverte, parce qu'on est aussi, c'est vrai, confronté à une réalité économique, une dure réalité économique. Par contre, moi, je me pose une question qui me semble on a peu abordé cet après-midi, c'est vraiment sur l'éducation à l'environnement, donc je pense en particulier aux jeunes publics. On a vu des chiffres, donc c'est vrai que Qu'en est-il dans vos, dans vos, pour vos régions, en tout cas, sur des actions durables d'éducation à l'environnement et non pas du one-shot, c'est-à-dire je viens avec ma classe dans un centre et puis à la limite c'est une, plutôt une sortie ludique et je repars et puis voilà. Qu'en est-il sur des réels projets d'éducation à l'environnement où on travaille durablement sur le fond avec les enfants Parce que moi aujourd'hui, c'est une impression personnelle. Euh, à titre personnel, j'ai l'impression qu'en temps de difficile, en temps de crise, euh, on retourne sur nos, nos essentiels et ces aspects-là d'éducation à l'environnement euh, pâtissent un peu. Donc je ne sais pas ce qu'il en est dans vos, dans vos régions sur euh, ces trava ce travail qui pourrait être fait durablement avec euh, les écoles, en particulier euh, pour le très jeune public. Good question. How effective can a school visit to a center be if it's just going to be maybe one morning or something? Um, anyone would like to comment? We had the education environmental program before the crisis for the for the young people, for the children who was in primary or secondary school. 
we go there we uh, we work with the with the teachers we also work with the children in the school also in the center but uh, since 2012 we have to uh, to park this program because we have enough enough people to uh, to develop the program and it's a shame because we work with uh, with the local uh, schools with the schools that are near the the the, the natural park and it's a, it's a program that we have parked but uh, we we want to 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 um, to begin again or to take uh, again uh, to develop again but uh, we don't know when we are able to to develop it io credo che that one structure like ours could represent a sustainable environmental education because our activities are repeated each year at school and each year you will implement other activities and integrate other activities and last year we have made an experience on a way to have an education for very young children from kindergarten in Italy. They are five years old. And we have theater activities for them. But n not inside a theater on a room like this one with equipment. But in the woods, in the fields, in front of the river, or in front in the lake, in front of the river, of the lake, and that was quite satisfying, very satisfying, actually. That could be a way to react. Yep, um, that's a good way. And finding different ways to get messages across is always helpful. Um, for our part, we have wetland education centers, and we're doing some research now to see how much um, these young people retain. So we're contacting them after a month, six months, and a year to ask what they remember from their visit and whether it's changed their attitudes towards uh, wetlands. Uh, do we have another question? No? Ah, sorry. <laughs> and then... Merci. Juste un commentaire en rapport avec ce qui vient d'être dit à propos de la sensibilisation des enfants ou des jeunes en général. Je pense que pour la partie française, en tous les cas, il y a des initiatives intéressantes lancées par des laboratoires de recherche sur l'écologie en général, de collaboration avec les maisons pour la science, qui sont des structures qui émergent maintenant, dans, qui fleurissent dans plusieurs régions. Alors je ne sais pas ici où est-ce qu'elle est située, mais il y a plusieurs régions qui disposent de ces structures et qui sont des tremplins très intéressants pour faire passer des messages, sensibiliser non seulement d'ailleurs les enfants, mais aussi les enseignants à cette démarche et à cette ouverture. Voilà. Definitely, I think where you have these science centers, that's a great way, and certainly training the teachers is probably as important as, as training the young people. So, question here and then Olivier. En fait, c'était un peu dans la même idée. On voit le développement de sciences participatives. Et par exemple, en Bretagne, on le fait avec euh, les lycées agricoles. où euh, on va, Nous, on va fournir en fait, des protocoles relativement simples. Ils peuvent mesurer euh, des matières en suspension dans les rivières, regarder les macro-invertébrés bintiques, et donc avoir une idée concrète tous les ans, faire des suivis. Et, euh, nous, ça nous donne un petit peu de données, même si ça, voilà, à prendre avec précaution. Et eux voient un peu les enjeux en fonction euh, de là où ils échantillonnent. Euh, un deuxième point qui se développe aussi, euh, c'est des films de promotion très courts qu'on met ensuite sur les réseaux sociaux. Je prendrai l'exemple de l'Association française de l'hymnologie qui a fait un film cette année, donc je vous invite à aller le voir. Hein, c'est juste, euh, je crois que c'est 17 minutes au total, bon, c'est quand même 17 minutes. Mais ça explique vraiment très bien c'est quoi l'hymnologie, à quoi ça sert et pourquoi il faut en pr protéger l'environnement. Donc, je ne sais pas, je verrais très bien un film qui pourrait être sur les lacs de plaine, par exemple, et euh, tourner à l'échelle européenne et montrer euh, 
ce n'est pas hyper coûteux et après on peut le diffuser sur les sites web et les réseaux sociaux. Great. Yep. Good idea. And I think one, one notion of citizen science is, you know, you, a lot of scientists are like, oh, we don't want to get local people involved in monitoring. They'll produce rubbish information and we can't use it. And you're like, well, you're missing the point slightly because if you get them involved, they'll get interested and they'll change their behavior and they'll understand. So I think citizen science, really great way to go forward. Any comments? Oui, peut-être. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I, I will do en French. Euh, ce que disait euh, Alexandrine, effectivement, on fait de plus en plus de choses, en tout cas, euh, je parle pour euh, mes collègues euh, en France, euh, en termes de sciences participatives et aussi euh, vraiment euh, développer des outils de communication via les réseaux sociaux. Euh, je pense aussi notamment à certaines écoles doctorales, dont, dont Rennes, qui ont mis euh, en place euh, ma thèse en trois minutes qui doit être expliqué via Facebook, qui a été expliqué au grand public. C'était vraiment très intéressant, vraiment. Un bon exercice à la fois pour les futurs scientifiques qui ne sont pas toujours très accessibles pour le grand public et euh, également euh, pour, euh, pour les gens qui euh, découvrent ce qui se fait euh, en recherche scientifique à l'heure actuelle. Euh, également, euh, bon, je parle au nom de la, la Maison du Lac, de Grand Lieu, effectivement, l'idée c'est de se rendre service les uns les autres et ne pas marcher sur les plans de demande de, des gestionnaires et des scientifiques qui, sont, euh, qui travaillent très très bien sur Grand Lieu. Et l'idée c'est qu'on travaille en bonne intelligence aussi bien avec euh, les gestionnaires que les scientifiques ici pour intervenir sur la réserve et dans l'autre sens pour que la réserve intervienne ici euh, au centre euh, d'éducation à l'environnement. Euh, C'est comme ça que, par exemple, cet été, on va mettre en place un premier projet de science participative sur les orthoptères, donc les criquets et les sauterelles, euh, afin d'aider le travail de, de Jean-Marc sur les parcelles du conservatoire qui, ont lieu, qui sont situées entre le centre et, et le lac. Parce que Jean-Marc a beau être très très fort, il ne peut pas être partout sur les 2700 hectares euh, sur lesquels il travaille avec, euh, avec ses collègues. Euh, donc voilà, c'est des petites choses qui vont se faire. Donc par rapport à ce que tu disais, Alexandrine, où bon, c'est des données qui vont être prises avec des pincettes. Là, ici, on fera ça avec le grand public, mais encadré avec une stagiaire de master et puis moi. Donc les données sont on va être vraiment utilisées, standardisées pour la base de données euh, de, de la réserve naturelle. Voilà. Great. Thank you. Olivier. Alors, du coup, ma question est pour toi, Chris. <rire> savoir comment ça se passe au Royaume-Uni. <rire> et et j'ai vu que vous meniez dans vos centres, notamment, euh, deux expériences euh, originales. Une première, euh, c'est une exposition d'animaux géants en Lego. Et une deuxième expérience qui doit avoir lieu, je crois, pendant les vacances février, c'est un concours de splatch, un concours de un concours euh, ou un championnat euh, de saut euh, dans des flaques d'eau euh, qui a lieu en plein hiver, donc en février, pour les, pour les jeunes enfants. Et voilà, je voulais que tu nous, dises un, tu nous en dises un petit peu plus sur cette démarche, de, de, notamment de, de concours de splatch. Ça s'entend bien, ce concours de splatch Ok. Um... It's an interesting question because for me, uh, I'm, by training, I'm a biologist and, and I work largely with conservationists. So when in our center they have animals made of Lego and someone encouraging small children to jump in a puddle, I'm kind of like, no. <laughs> But it's really good for bringing people into the center. Everybody loves Lego. Um, the splash competition is great to bring small children in and they get wet and they have fun and they learn Uh, about wetlands at the same time. So for us, as a wetland center, we run a fine balance between being a theme park um, and between being an environmental education and serious conservation organization. So um, uh, my colleagues who run the center, the, the visitor center, are very uh, gifted uh, and knowledgeable about how to bring people into the centers. Um, so whilst I may disagree somewhat with having a Lego swan or a Lego otter, um, it brings loads of visitors. So it's a great way of getting them in. Um, I think we still have to do some work on looking at how many of them go away with an understanding of wetlands because they've jumped in a puddle. 
I don't know. Um, but it certainly brings them into the center, and then we have uh, education activities and signs and the rest of the reserve that they can visit. So it's a great way of pulling the visitors in. It generates money for us because people pay uh, to come in as well. So I think overall, um, it's a good thing, but you just have to make sure that you link it closely to conservation messages as well and not just have it as a tourist attraction. So, yeah, good question. And just, just to know... Uh Splashing or Lego. Yeah. Just, just a curiosity. Are you interesting? Yeah. Uh, you are interesting. Um, you, for, to enter, I mean, we, we, for, for me, it, again, it's a little bit of a barrier for people to visit our centers because you have to pay, I think, for an adult, you have to pay 12 pounds, maybe, which is like how many euros? Not as many euros as it used to be. <laughs> yeah. So it's cheaper now to come. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's definitely a barrier for some people because it's expensive, but it's cheaper than going to the zoo or another theme park or a similar attraction. So although it's expensive for coming into a nature reserve, um, you also get activities and there's a restaurant and shop and blah, blah. So it, it kind of is a balance between helping us to make money to run the activities uh, and maybe being a barrier to some local people who maybe wouldn't come because it costs a fair amount of money. You do, we do, like, like you get a family price or you can join as a member, so it will save you money if you, if you want. But yeah, I agree. It's expensive, um, but it, it helps pay for the conservation work that then the organization does. Any more for any more, as we say in English. Aha. Maxime. Au niveau des sciences participatives, il y a aussi en France le Muséum national d'histoire naturelle qui développe beaucoup ses démarches à travers des applications, par exemple de d'ornithologie pour amateurs. Et non seulement ces démarches permettent une sensibilisation du public, donc des applications sur leur téléphone, et cela permet aussi d'avoir des données qui derrière sont utilisables par les scientifiques dans la mesure où ils font des protocoles assez simples. Euh, C'est aussi des démarches qui se développent sur les mauvaises herbes en ville. Euh, les, la, la ville de Paris est assez impliquée là-dedans. Et tout, toutes ces rencontres, oui, effectivement, entre le public et le scientifique, où chacun fait des compromis, ça permet vraiment une prise de conscience. On ne touchera jamais tous les publics, mais peut-être pour, pour nos visiteurs, effectivement, le Muséum d'Histoire Naturelle arrive à développer une expertise là-dedans et aussi à aller jusqu'à des études un peu sociologiques pour voir l'impact de ces outils. Donc ça peut être intéressant. Yep, um, it's a good example of broadening uh, the interaction. And I went to a citizen science uh, lecture the other day, and they were talking about using apps on your smartphone to record things. Um, and they were talking about gamifying. Sorry, translators, but gamifying, I didn't know what that was. But it's basically making it into a game so that you can reach another level when re you record certain things or increase your knowledge. Or, you know, it's a great way of encouraging particularly young people to use technology to get them more interested in, um, in nature. So whilst it kind of is paradoxical in a way because you're encouraging them to use their phones, um, you want them to kind of engage with nature. At least they are kind of engaging with nature through their through their. Uh, applications and their phones. Okay, um, we are on time, I think, pretty much. So thank you very much uh, to the audience and to the panel. Big round of applause.